Thanks for joining us, John. First up, could you please provide your name, your qualifications, current affiliations, and your area of research expertise? Well, my name is John Phillips. Um, I'm a senior lecturer at the School of Optometry and Vision Science at the University of Auckland. Uh, I have a PhD and a, I'm a member of the British College of Optometrists. Um, my area of research is myopia and um, childhood myopia in particular, but also uh, mechanisms of the development of myopia. Your paper with Safal Kanal asks the question, which low-dose atropine? And what prompted you to ask this question? Well, the, the, what prompted me to ask the question really was that um, I see a lot of my colleagues uh, um, adopting 0.01% uh, atropine and, uh, in their clinical practice. And there's quite a lot of um, literature on the efficacy of 0.01% uh, atropine in terms of slowing refractive change in myopia. And um, uh, Don Mutti, a, a while ago, an American uh, uh, researcher, pointed out that there is a discrepancy between the um, efficacy uh, of atropine in slowing the uh, refractive change and the efficacy in slowing eye growth. And it seemed to me that there was that the clinicians who were essentially looking at refractive change were missing um, the uh, observation that maybe this was not slowing the eye growth. And the eye growth, the um, abnormal eye growth in myopia, is the basis for the uh, detrimental effects of myopia later in life, which is uh, stretching of the uh, retina and stretching of the choroid. And so the, the motivation really for this um, paper was to point out that when we talk about low-dose atropine, uh, there is 0.01% atropine, and that's the one that people have kind of assumed is the low dose that we should be using. And of course, it's clinically, it's very um, popular because it has very few side effects. Um, but if it doesn't work uh, in slowing eye growth, then in fact, uh, we're not doing anything particularly useful. And in fact, uh, if we put children on 0.01% uh, atropine and it's not slowing their eye growth, then uh, we, what we aren't doing is putting them on a dose that will slow their eye growth. And so I think it was quite important to point out that, that, that this, is a, this is an important issue and that one, one probably should be using higher doses of low-dose atropine. Why is myopia and how we treat it becoming such a global concern? Um, it's a global concern because of its prevalence. Um, the prevalence is, is increasing it's been estimated that nearly 50% uh, of the world's population will be myopic by 2050. I'm not quite sure that I, I believe that necessarily, but um, because I think people are waking up to the idea that we ought to be altering our lifestyle possibly to prevent our children um, becoming myopic. Um, and I think that's the, that's the key is to prevent myopia rather than try and deal with it uh, once it's happened. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that those... Um, attempts are, are successful um, but it's but it's very important because uh, because of its prevalence uh, and it's very high at the moment um, and its detrimental effect later in life potential detrimental later in life uh, because it's associated with um, uh, uh, retinal detachment uh, it's associated with myopic maculopathy and the stretching also that can be associated with glaucoma as a basis for glaucoma, and, and for some reason, uh, myopes have um, a cataract earlier than uh, non myopes. So, there are a number of associated conditions that are potentially blinding. And in countries in which myopia is, um, has a high prevalence, myopia has become a significant cause of blindness in China. In, in areas of China, it is the first or second cause of uh, blindness in certain cities. Here's the tricky one. How can a practicing optometrist best use this information that you described to inform their day-to-day -day practice? Well, yes, I, I, think, um, I think in practice, a practitioners just need to be aware of the fact that if they start a child on 0.01% atropine, uh, they may actually be not slowing eye growth and that they may actually have to switch to a higher dose. Uh, and I guess I'm putting forward the idea that it might be better when when a child is prescribed atropine 
usually they are progressing very rapidly. So usually that's really the point at which they, they most need the treatment, uh, the most need the effective treatment. And so it may be a good idea to consider using a higher dose earlier than using a lower dose. So that uh, uh, the, the logic has been at the moment that we use 0.01% atropine. Uh, it doesn't have any uh, real, real side effects. And if it's ineffective, if it's found to be ineffective, then we increase the dose. Now, it will take a year to find out whether the 0.01% whether the, um, atropine is being effective. And that's a year, but if it's not effective, that's a year lost, actually. Uh, whereas if somebody had prescribed 0.025 or 0.05%, they might have uh, had some blowback from the patient objecting to the side effects. But actually... Uh, they would be, in terms of myopic control, they would actually be, they would be benefiting the patient rather than giving them the 0.01%, uh, which has few clinical side effects, but actually may well not be effective. It's just a consideration, I think, that, that um, uh, needs, to be, needs to be taken into account. It isn't, uh, it isn't an edict or anything like that. There have been plenty of edicts uh, about, uh, in fact, the literature is full of um, apparently, ideas that we should be using 0.01% atropine. There's actually quite a lot of that, and this is what I'm suggesting is something counter to that. And lastly, though you've already kind of covered it in your earlier responses, what's your next phase of research in this area? What I what I think needs to be done now is to be looking at um, discontinuing atropine and what conditions and how one might discontinue atropine because. Uh, it's all right, well putting children on atropine, but they can't be on atropine for the rest of their life. Uh, and so they have to be taken off it. And the issue then is how do you do, when uh, do you take a child off atropine and how do you take a child off atropine? Um, because if you sim simply take them off very suddenly, then they are likely to rebound and regress. Um, so the idea of possibly tapering them, uh, of course, Unfortunately, there is a disconnect here because uh, what's clinical practice is really way ahead in terms of use of atropine than researchers are in understanding the, uh, the way that it works and how it should be used. And so I think, I think really that the next, um, the next area of research needs to be in how one uh, takes a child off atropine and when one takes a child of atropine, and whether one transfers a child who's been on atropine onto some other method of myopia control, like orthokeratology or contact lenses, or maybe combines um, atropine with, with um, other methods. So I think that's the main, uh, that's the future, um, future research area. I don't know um, what grounds people are using to take children off atropine but I doubt whether they're very consistent and I, I kind of doubt that they are, um, that they have any, any kind of um, scientific uh, backup to the reasons why they're being removed. Um, you know, what one, there's been this hope that because the sort of natural history of myopia is that it generally tends to level off at about age 18, uh, there's been this hope that, okay, well, if we can inhibit progression until the child's 18, then we can take them off this um, whatever it is we've used and that they won't progress after that i think that may be a false hope and i think we might find that uh, what happens is that they still continue to progress after the age of 18 when they're taken off uh, atropine or any other uh, myopic control mechanism but we we don't know uh, we, we honestly don't know thanks for joining us john